In the 2018 growing season, we had what was our wettest year in the history of the state of Maryland. The folks in the Midwest uh, this year are having what essentially are apocalyptic rains in places where they don't even have their corn planted yet. It's almost mid-June. We need to figure out how can we make our, our soil respond for us and be able to handle more adverse conditions that we see on a more regular basis. To me, it's just a natural evolution that soil health makes sense. But I think there's still a lot to learn. Because you don't have a lot of people planting green, do you? Um, no, not too much, not too much. So we've been doing cover crops through um, the state program for probably over 20 years. I think they started around 1998, 1999. Um, we never wrote anything down, so I don't really have any uh, way to know exactly, but roughly 20 years. And our goal was always to plant them and then kill them as soon as we could. And by the state uh, program, you, could, you were allowed to kill them March 1st. Um, so we always wanted to, to get them burned off as soon as we could. Uh, we wouldn't do tillage necessarily, but a lot of times we'd spray them with glyphosate or put our chemicals down. Um, and it wasn't until we made some mistakes, didn't get some fields sprayed, and we ended up having to plant them green. And that was when we uh, really realized that, that it seemed like a much better way to go. Uh, but what we were learning is that if the soil was healthier, it planted better, we got more days to plant, and uh, we were building resiliency in the soil. So when we got hurricanes and five inch rains, we were getting a lot less runoff. But the, the very strange or the peculiar part of planting green or planting into a green field is that it appears very highly varied. You look across it and there's things that are different heights, there's cereal rye, there's, there's flowers growing, there's crimson clover. But if you take your shovel and you dig into the soil, you find that underneath of all this stuff, the soil is actually much more consistent. So this field that looks wild, that looks out of control, that looks like we don't have control of, is actually much more consistent and monolithic and better crop growing conditions and seedling nursery than it is if it was all monolithic. Uh, we're trying to, to grow more and more uh, cover crops, more biomass, and we feel like the more biomass we can accumulate uh, within the cover crops and the crop, the more we're putting back into the soil. And at the same time, what we're doing is helping to mitigate climate change. Uh, so the purpose of the system was not to mitigate climate change, but the result of the system is one that does help mitigate climate change by sequestering carbon into the soil. So this, this is the perfect way to sequester carbon, which is photosynthesis. Um, the problem is when you grow crops, you only grow, you're only utilizing the sun several months out of the year. If you can grow cover crops, then all of a sudden we can start to get a year round system of harvest of the sun. Uh, what we're trying to do here is figure out if we can actually start to overlap the crops. So when we have seedling crops, the cover crops are still growing, and then we kill them off in a way that as they're dying, the other crop is coming up so that we're getting as much sunshine utilization as we can, therefore pulling as much carbon down through the root system of the plant, placing it into the soil, which is building our soil health, it's making the soil healthier, it's making it more resilient. And as long as we don't till that soil, that carbon is then secured in the soil. Time for Bernicia. I wasn't getting an RTK signal for a little bit there. I wasn't getting a signal for the guidance. So that's, I started out, I was kind of wiggling because I was paying attention to that, trying to figure out why I wasn't getting a signal. So one of the limitations in our, in our system that we're organic is weed control. And how do you deal with weed, weed control? And historically that's been done via tillage um, which, not always, but quite often, it's counter, 
counterproductive when, when we're talking, having a conversation about soil health because we're, we're breaking down that soil structure so much because you're doing all, the, all this tillage. You know, the best could be somewhere between organic, somewhere between what Trey does, but it's figuring out how do you get paid for that? Because no, no farm is sustainable if it's not profitable. Doesn't matter how green your practices are, how much carbon you sequester, none of those things matter if you can't be profitable. weather notification on your phone and starts buzzing at you. If there's tornado, chance of tornado warning or whatever, and that happens five minutes later, after you get that first alert, obviously it won something that they, they were calling for in advance. One, I was letting the tractor drive itself straight, and then I was using a map like that to know when I got to the edge of the field, because I just couldn't see. And by the time I got up to the barns, and parked the tractor and got out, it stopped raining. I was in eighth grade, he was in 10th. 55 years ago now or longer. We both were in 4-H, but in, in different clubs. So the first time I met him was him boarding the bus. I was already on it. We dated on and off. Got married in uh, 72. Raised three children. I already knew a sister. I didn't know she had a brother. <laughs> That jive with her story? <laughs> or you haven't asked her yet? <laughs> I'm Laura Hill, and um, my husband Roland and I operate Deerfield Farm. We have uh, about 1,800 acres, tillable acres. Most of that is uh, rented, leased ground. And uh, we have five poultry houses, about 130,000, 25,000 capacity. I think for De Delaware, we're probably considered mid-size. For the, the country, we're probably considered small. Um, I need to bring in the box, we call them box lids, the trays that go under there. And then we have big box lids that I need to put together um, they will go down a center row in the brood chamber where we put extra feed for the chicks. And, and they'll stay down for about a week, you know, seven to eight days. Back in the old days, when we were had um, the curtains, you also opened these doors and you had screen doors. And that was more light, more, really more air movement. It was the thought behind it. The more fresh air yeah. you could get in, but like I said, you know, in the middle of summer, you reach a point where you can't cool down anymore. You're fighting a losing battle in, you know, because all you're dealing with is hot air you're bringing into the house. And that's when they came up with the cooling pad system for cooling the birds. But you needed to close up the houses so you were only having cool air being brought in. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So it is just um, the changes in how the, controlling the environment inside here. Yeah, the first section, the brood chamber itself, where the chicks will first come, will start. It's actually 40% of the house. So the first partition curtain is right there where that black pipe begins. So the center 40% is where the birds are going to be, it's going to be warmed up for the chicks. Yeah. And these are the two peats. The two peat in the ceiling.
just making sure everything gets set up so that way when the feed starts running in, it, uh, it'll fill to a certain level and everything works the way it's supposed to. That's what I'm working on right now. You can start to feel the, the heat radiating off the tube. Mm -hmm. it, uh, within a, a half a degree, really, they'll come on and go off as needed. <laughs> yeah, I guess you might say it smells like burnt toast. So as contract growers, um, you know, with, with that whole process, um, the company really owns the chickens. We provide the management, the housing, and we control the manure. So that responsibility for handling it according to nutrient management regulations is on us. And all the, the litter of manure out of the poultry houses is used back on the farm here to grow crops, corn, soybeans, small grains, a few vegetables. Nutrient management plans are a guide for the farmers and they make sense. They, you know, there's no need economically in the environment that you have with um, agriculture products. There's no need to over apply. So you wanna make sure you have enough to produce, you know, the yield you need, but you don't want to over apply. You're just wasting money. Of course it goes in, they grind that back into chicken feed and it comes back to the farm. We feed the chickens, collect the manure and it starts all over again. You know, whatever you're doing with your soils um, is interconnected with nutrient management and you know, what you're applying to the soil and um, the practices you're using. We like to say we never leave work. We can never just close the door and walk away for the day. There's always something to do. I mean, it's. Um, I think it's more so a piece of not being, not the difference between conventional and a pasture-based system, but just the difference in being a dairy farm versus a row crop farmer. We're a 600 cow organic dairy uh, located on the eastern shore, right off the Chesapeake Bay. We farm about 1,400 acres, all certified organic. This is a balance of row crop acres and then pasture lands. We were actually approached to transition our dairy to certified organic um, because we had certifi certified organic row crop acres and um, that transition on row crop acres is three years. And um, for the dairy, we were able to do one, a one-time whole herd one-year transition. So we made the decision to transition our dairy from conventional production into organic in 2015. We actually started our transition in spring of 2016 and became certified in spring of 2017. We had a consultant come in and kind of look and just to be sure we did have enough acres that we could, and close enough proximity to the barns, that we could meet that grazing requirement because we knew that was a big piece to, that was kind of the big piece to the organic that we needed to have in place and um, having enough acres that were certified that could go into pasture to um, get us through transitioning the other acres into pastures. The real motivator there were economic reasons. We, we had an opportunity um, to secure a higher milk price and a long-term contract for that milk, which was attractive. And it was in an area that we were comfortable in. We had been doing organic row crop production for over 20 years. Um, and so this was sort of the next logical evolution of the business to transition the dairy as well. Now, when we signed our contract, the organic market was extremely short on milk and they were looking um, 
they were actively looking for volume. And when we signed our contract, we signed a five-year contract with a great pay price. Um, and within six months, the market had completely flipped. So we, we do have our contract and it is a contract that's being honored. I think that we will have challenges going forward with where current um, mailbox prices are in the organic milk market. Um, I think that without growing so that we can spread our fixed costs across more cows, then you know it could be challenging financially for us, really. The pasture-based system from a work standpoint is challenging. Um, it essentially adds a feed bunk that we're managing for the cows and it increases our labor labor needs um, as compared to just having the cows in the barn. We had to install laneways for grazing and fence and um, establish pastures and all of that took a lot of, it was very time and labor intensive. Um, and then we also, um, we didn't have to, but at the same time we were undergoing construction of a new milking facility. So that has kind of impacted work-life balance and significantly. From an economic standpoint, when we are grazing and have high grass intakes, our income over feed cost goes up, even if we see a decrease in milk production. So economically, it's beneficial for us. From an environmental standpoint, that's probably where we see the largest gain. Um, when you look at fields that had historically been in row crop production, and now they're in pasture, when we have these large rain events that we've been seeing, and look at the water that comes off of these fields, um, first, our uptake on those fields is greater because there's greater root structure in the soil, greater soil structure. Um, and then the water that does come off, you can, you can see the difference in the clarity of the water coming down the waterway. Um, and that's been a big change, especially in an organic system where in row crop we depend so heavily upon tillage. Uh, we don't see those same type of sediment and topsoil losses. This year and um, the spring before, we had very wet springs. Um, we had significant rainfall that came right about the time that we ideally would have been planting our crops. And it really pushed planting dates later. And in the organic system, we're all, we are already planting later. We like to you know, plant a little bit later. We want that ground temperature to be higher. So seed's gonna get in the ground and get up quickly. Um, but I, that was, significantly exacerbated with the wet springs we've had the past two years. This year, not quite as bad as last year. Um, you know, last year we were June 25th getting corn in the ground and that is, I mean, that's late for us. And, you know, you look at the Midwest this past year and all the severe flooding they've had. I mean, that definitely, um, that's, that's a huge impact on American agriculture as a whole. And I think to me, it was such a shame when all the flooding was going on, the media coverage that lacked there, because I think it's really important as the American consumer becomes more and more removed from agriculture itself. And it's easy for them to go to the grocery store and complain and balk about food prices when, and not understand why, but events like that are huge and definitely have, you know, they don't have an immediate effect at the grocery level, at the consumer level, but they do have a trickle down effect at the consumer level. It's less common for us to get the day long soaking rains now as it is to get the rain that drops an inch of rain in 30 minutes. And it's trying to get the soil to take up that much water that quickly is a challenge. 
And so if it doesn't take it up, that water has to go somewhere. Um, and when it runs off, it's taking topsoil with it. I think having the pasture-based system as part of Fairhill Farms gives us more resiliency because it keeps a living cover on the fields year round. Uh, grass and sod create a very thick root mat um, as well as a thatch over the soil to help insulate that soil, uh, especially when we see hard rain events. That rain isn't able to hit bare soil and bounce the same way and dislodge sediment. It gets filtered down. We also see greater soil life in terms of microbes and worms in the soil. Um, so we have greater water uptake that we see. And what we see is an increase in organic matter on those fields over time. And the other item that we see is greater, um, greater nitrogen availability coming from the organic matter in the soil where we have ground that we've taken out of pasture and put into corn and come back and done PSNT tests for nitrogen availability, that land doesn't need additional nitrogen added to it because there's sufficient nitrogen that was produced from the sod. Uh, my name is Trey Hill. Um, I farm in Rock Hall, Maryland. Uh, we're on the shores of the Chesapeake Bay, and we grow corn, uh, wheat, and soybeans on a little over 10,000 acres. You know, I never dreamed that I could be part of, you know, my initial thing with climate change was you know, upon doing the research, what can I do to mitigate my impact on the climate? We put in solar, you know, we run newer equipment, so we've got tier four engines and this sort of thing. We're trying to burn less fuel, you know, financial and everything. We're trying to turn less ground, but I didn't think of, or I never knew that, you know, plants growing in a field sequester carbon and put them into the soil. It just was not something that was in my education, I guess you call it, I don't know. It just never crossed our mind. Um, so as we learn more about it, and we realized what we were doing was climate smart. Now it's part of our management strategy. Now it's how do we maximize that? How do we you know, make it better? How do we improve it? So it's financial, agronomic, environmental, and climate are kind of go into all of our decision making. Um, not all of it's great. You know, I mean, there's things where we burn more propane than we probably would have to because we get our crops in, or you know, a tractor burns more fuel than maybe it needs to, or whatever, you know, we're always trying to improve it, but it's become it's only recently become part of our decision-making process. And I think as more far, there's lots of farmers that, that agree with me um, or that are doing this similar things. But I think as that becomes more prevalent, then hopefully there will be a natural transition. Whether or not that occurs, I don't know. Climate change is kind of a weird thing because it's a political, it has political connotations as well, um, which make it difficult because you have farmers that are um, by nature, a very conservative group, rural communities throughout the world or tend to be more conservative, whereas the, the folks in the cities tend to be more liberal. Um, and that makes it much more difficult to talk about certain topics um, because of that. So we'll move Kevin around, we'll take him to the other truck to get a load of water for Tyler for spraying abundant and then I'll go take you to Jack, who's scouting down at the field that you saw planted. Scouting is kinda, kinda simple. I walk through the field kinda randomly. So right now I'm really just looking for weeds, bugs, disease, stage of growth, and then also uh, what, the, what the stand looks like, how many, how many plants per acre we have. Um, I'll probably do four stand count checks. That's what I have my, my little rope for. Um, I mark off basically one four thousandth of an acre, and then I count the number of plants multiplied by 4,000, gives me an estimate of how many plants we have per acre. Do that a number of times, say like four or five times. Take the average, it gives us a, a pretty decent estimate of what the field actually has in it. Cover crops make it a little more difficult to scout sometimes because if I didn't have any of this brown stuff here I could I could just look out and I could see oh there's a little yellow patch there there's a little yellow patch there there's a little 
brown patch there, things are, something is off there. But here I have to do a bit more zigging and zagging across the field to make sure that I actually see pretty much everything. Um, and it's a little hard to do that if it's 95 degrees out and you're looking at a 500 acre field. <laughs> I think yesterday I drank about a gallon and a half of water. But then I usually, I can usually get through about 250 acres in like an hour, hour and 15, something like that. That's kind of, kind of my goal. It takes a lot of walking fast and... You noticed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Trey also likes a lot of pictures. Unfortunately, usually he only gets bad stuff from me. I'll say, oh, we've got weeds here, we've got disease here, this is what it looks like, this is how big of an area it's affecting. This is Johnson grass. It looks a lot like corn, it's not. Um, but it's, it's really hard to kill. It's a pain. <laughs> so we're doing a lot of research to figure out how we can grow the cover crop and the commodity crop simultaneously. And there's a fine line between where they become competitors versus complements. So on several fields, we'll pass that line this year. And what we're trying to do is, is plant early. So we're planting in April. And then we didn't spray, uh, like for example, here at the home farm, we planted, I think April 2nd and sprayed May 5th. So we went five weeks with the cover crops thriving with the little beans in it. Now I think that was probably a little too far. Um, but what we're then doing is trying to do the research to figure out what's going on in the field and why it's going on. Still working on emptying this tank out a couple hours later. So what it is, the grain's coming up this auger into the elevator and it's dumping it into this tank right over here behind us. Yeah. Okay, because I know Dave had to turn the fans on that time. So. Okay. Yeah, we'll see what happens. Hopefully, it stays running. It just depends on if we get pods that come break free from the walls and stop it again. We'll have to turn the fans on. When we turn the fans on, it pushes them down in the hole and comes out of the auger. Okay. So, All right. just let me know if you need help with it. Okay. All right. We're almost ready. We all walk fast around here. <laughs> so, this lets us know our volume that we're getting out of the fields. Uh, every truck that we bring in from our fields will run across the scale, weigh it, dump it, and then get our empty weight and that will give us how much for a bushel per acre we're getting off of the farm. So I just gotta pull it ahead to get to the trailer. So my brother and I's farm, it it did about like it did last year, um, as far as yield wise. But we had some issues with some of the other fields. And the yield wasn't nearly as good as it was last year. Um, but I think it was more stuff that Mother Nature threw at us than anything else. So it's what do you mean by that? Uh, just the weather. It was cold and wet, uh, and it just. 
Yeah, so it, it really hurt hurt the uh, the yield on it quality. So uh, every year is different. Yeah, we have some fields that haven't seen a, a chisel plow or a moldboard plow or a disc for probably 20 years. Um, um, you know, it, it cuts down on fuel usage and the amount of time that it takes to farm it. Um, and it's, you know, knocking, taking tillage out of the equation you know, you're taking out at least two to three passes across the ground that you no longer have to do. Um, and, you know, with the cover crops and stuff, it, it does help with, um, like I said, holding the moisture and helping it work into the soil, holding nutrients, um, being able to get onto the fields uh, sooner. Um, so, yeah, I think the, the benefits really do outweigh um, any cons, if there are any, um, really haven't had any issues. If we go back over 30 years, where everything was being plowed and disked before it was planted, you know, the, the winds would come in the spring and, and dry up and start blowing, and you would just see the soil blowing and, and leaving the area. <laughs> So, you know, looking back on that, you knew that that was eventually probably ending up in the waterways. We actually had a field that, uh, well, last year's planting season, it was a field that we'd had in no-till for quite a while. And it, it used to have a lot of wet spots when we first take it, took it over. And being in no-till year after year, we had less and less of an issue with these wet spots. And then we decided this one plant in the year, we were going to put vegetables in there, so we worked the ground. Uh, and turn around, we got a lot of rain. And so last year and this year, that field's actually been kind of a problem for us because we had to, well, we made a mess of it last year, so then we still had to go back this year and disc it to smooth it up, which, and you still wound up with wet spots that we're having to deal with again. Whereas if we had never done that in the first place and just left a no-till, probably would have been okay. So kind of one of the things, kind of kicking ourselves a little bit on it, but. But yeah, you definitely on that field, you saw the difference between between the two practices. You know, I can remember them having tractors stuck, which is very unusual now. And that was my biggest dread when Roland would come in the house and say, I've got a tractor stuck, you need to help turn me out. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> it wasn't my, it's was beyond my comfort level. <laughs> Especially the first time, because I didn't understand about taking the slack out of the tow rope. <laughs> it would be jerking him, and then hand, hand signals would fly. <laughs> but, um, you know, we just, we don't have those problems with no till. There's your tassel and the little uh, little pieces of pollen fall off, and they each one of them uh, fertilize or land on one of these little silks, and each one of them is attached to a, a spot on the ear, and that's what develops a kernel. And you notice uh, this is a no-till. All of our corn is no-till. So fair amount of uh, dead material mulch left from the uh, rye and clover that was in here. Even when you get your hard rains, it kind of cushions the raindrops mm -hmm. and pack the soil. It doesn't have uh, the amount of erosion and runoff that you get from a till field. The last field we were in hasn't had, and this field as well, hasn't had any rain in a couple of weeks. We had a lot of 90 degree temperatures and a lot of wind. And you can see this corn is a lot greener all the way from the ground up. Where the last field, the bottom leaves are starting to turn brown. These leaves are starting to 
what we call roll or curl up as signs of the heat and moisture stress. So the irrigation is uh, paying for itself right now. Well, here we go. I've got a pond. So I'll, I'll actually have to wait till after everything's done running to come back because if I try digging, I'm just going to have a I'm just going to have a soup, soupy mess to try to deal with it. And so she's flooding this whole area around here. Buried about 18 inches below the ground. It's a permanent uh, process. I mean, it, it's not something you take out every year and replace. So you got to take that into consideration. Uh, and certainly can't do any deep tillage with it. So fits good with a no-till program. Leave the whole thing there. Got my tape, my splicer, trowel, something to lay on because it'll get dirty. <laughs> and a couple shovels. Actually, we'll go ahead and cross over. I've had some fields where people see all the flags and they wonder if uh, land's for sale because it's, and that it's survey marks. <laughs> it's like, nah, so I just got foxholes marked. <laughs> oh. oh, that's gonna be fun. I've actually got a groundhog in there. <laughs> yeah, he, he ducked down over there. Of course, it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. There are some issues, uh, rodents or groundhogs or fox will burrow down and Two holes of tape. So I'll start with this one and see what we get to. So that white, that white sand you're seeing there is usually a pretty good sign that you're getting close to the tape because, uh, well, because with that water shooting out of the tape, it's funny, it kind of separates the soil and you wind up with that. <laughs> I mean, I don't. You have to talk to a soil expert on what exactly is going on, but somehow it kind of separates it to where it's more of like a sandiness coming out of that spot. So here's our tape. And you can see they've been chewing on her. And so water's just, you just got these little pinholes now that water's shooting out rather than leaching out. I actually had a couple times, I found the tape and they just chewed right down, but they chewed it off. So it was like, it was just all open right here. Okay, so that was number one. Number two could be a little, a little more fun. <sighs> if you have a heavy rain event, even the, the best of practices, you're gonna have some runoff, uh, surface runoff, where with the, with the underground tape, you're, you're only using a small amount of water. This nice hot summer day is not, doesn't make for the best job. <laughs> and it's right there where the plant can get it immediately before it has a chance to, uh, to leach on out. If, you know, of course that depends on the management. If, if you're applying the water as needed, as a plant needs it, it should be of more benefit to the plant and to your bottom line. This is our farm here where Jared was working, okay? And this is where he was probably pointing out the field that, that butts our property here. And then this is a road that comes back to our house here, Webb's, uh, yeah, Webb's Landing. Our house is probably sitting here. And this is the Robinsonville Road, the, the main road. 
and all this is be devout. I'm just curious as how and then our chicken house is 50 feet off the property line. So I guess of course, have... of course, I don't know how far our chicken houses are. Well, I thought when we built this. Well, yeah, but I mean, they're they're, they're probably up. I don't know how far up this far line they is where yeah. they start. They're grandfathered in. Yeah. That who is? We would be grandfathered. Oh, I know that, but I'm thinking from their perspective, making sure that they had enough setback. Yeah, well, I can do to prepare your statement. Well, no, yeah, no, wait a minute now. R.D. Hill trustee, lands up. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I'm, I, I thought I there was I, your I, property on that end. I thought uh, I had the house. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I guess this one is Deerfield Farm Inc. over here. Yeah, that's you, dear. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure how you got that. I don't. I don't remember signing that paper. <laughs> <laughs> well, we did a state, state planning. The object was to put Equal. different holdings in different baskets. So my name, my trust actually is a house in this three acres. You get the chicken houses. <laughs> <laughs> I think I would choose the house I too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, temperatures are still cold enough that we do get that, um, we don't have flies in the wintertime or anything still. Um, but if we continue to see temperatures warming, um, certainly pressure there could pose an issue and on pastures as well. I mean, we, at different times, we'll have um, pressure from insects and fungal pressures and that kind of stuff in our pastures. So if, I think we, it's, our cyclical temperatures are important, especially living in a humid environment. You know, flies, they just harass the cattle. Um, it's hard for the cattle to get comfortable. They also transmit disease. Um, but more than anything, it's just a nuisance and it's, it takes up energy and it causes cattle to bunch. Even when the weather is comfortable for them outside, you'll still see cows that will bunch together because of fly pressure. And so once they bunch, that means they're taking time that they're not eating, they're not resting. And so we see a negative impact on milk production uh, as well as general cow health. So we, we have pedometers or Fitbits on the front legs of all the milking cows. Um, one, those are the ID system for the cows when they enter the milking parlor. That allows the parlor to ID which cow's milking and assign a milk weight to it. And then it's taking the information that it pulls off that chip in terms of steps per hour for activity, lying bouts, and it plugs those numbers into algorithms. And from there, uh, the system in the parlor is able to sort cows that it thinks are in estrus, or from a health standpoint, it allows the guys in the barn to pick up cows that she's not evidently sick yet, but we're catching her a day or two earlier. Um, and that's a big advantage in terms of when you look at the out outcome of that cow. We're definitely getting more rainfall during the spring. This year is not quite so bad, but we're getting, we're definitely getting hotter days and longer periods in the summer without rain. Um, we've always had hot, dry summer, so I don't think that that's that unusual that it's 95 degrees outside today and we're sweating and it's 100% humidity. That's Maryland summer. But for example, this year we're 200 uh, growing degree units ahead of schedule. This has been the warmest year in Maryland, but I also don't want to be the person that sees a Arctic blast in Minnesota and claims that there's no climate change because it's cold in Minnesota in the winter, which we've seen on social media.
I've lived on the Chesapeake Bay my whole life. And I've seen when we used to work around, a lot, some of our farm really had drained well, and you see a lot of erosion on those farms. And then we have some, a lot of low ground and everything is, that, uh, that we used to have to try to drain to get it out. But, uh, you know, all that soil disappears. It goes somewhere and it's gotta go in the bag. And I, since we started going green, you see less of it. In this general area, we've been getting fiercer rainstorms that dump more water at one single time than being stretched out over a couple of days period. So it's larger, larger amounts of rainfall on a shorter amount of time. So I wouldn't say it's, I wouldn't say it's more rainfall in general. It's just more at one time compared to being stretched out with smaller amounts of rain. The weather's turned more severe at times, you know, most of the time. We don't have um, a normal rain or a normal summer without having big storm, wet storms and that kind of stuff. But we do now. And the Midwest is really saying it. I mean, I know we probably didn't hear as much about it in the past because of the telephones and the communications, but it's, it's really gotten a lot worse, I think, and more severe. Being able to plant green and then having all those roots that are down the ground, you have the capillaries inside the soil just soaking a lot of that moisture up, where with conventional, a lot of it's just running off. When you do have erosion out of some of our fields, it's not that brown water, dirty water. I mean, it's more clear. If you look at a field that was just freshly worked up, planted, it's, it's gonna be brown and muddy and everything else. So, I don't know. I just like the do it. That's it. That's good. You done? You done yes, with me? I'm done with you. Thank you, John. Yeah, you can go back to your combine. So we have Jack and Pierre who are both interning here this summer. Uh, they're pulling soil samples, tissue samples, and biomass samples of the cover crop. So the soil samples are showing the nutrient availability. Um, we've had a couple of nice surprises there. Um, tissue analysis to see if the corn crop has the adequate uh, nutrients in the leaves, which is commonplace in farming for micronutrients and different things or late add-ins, but we're doing it to compare where we planted green into really high stuff and let the crops grow together versus where we sprayed it off and planted it brown. It's not so much an experiment as it is just a calculation. So because essentially the uh, cover crop has, by, by just by growing, has taken up some of the nutrients that were in the soil and is storing them in its plant matter. And so what we're trying to figure out is how much or how many nutrients are still bound just in the in the very surface of the soil in the cover crop to try to figure out how much it's storing and uh, when we get those nutrients back when they decompose. So we take the, the weight and we determine the percent of the weight that was carbon. And then we can multiply that out essentially across the whole area that has this cover crop. Um, and from that, we can sort of determine the number of uh, pounds or whatever unit you want to use uh, of carbon that was trapped and stored by these plants and that will now be stored in the soil as organic matter. And grasslands are really, really good at storing carbon, which we try to get close to with this, but that we, we can't really, because we don't, we don't make the, the plants quite as dense as those situations do. Can I have my backpack? Oh, 
Oh, these samples are big. I'm not gonna be able to fit that many in the backpack. Uh, it's just before, so the, the no cover crop area, we're, we're in it right now, I think. One of the other things that we are trying to do is to, I mean, obviously, pull up nitrogen from, lower it down in the soil and keep the uh, nitrogen and phosphorus out of uh, stormwater runoff and out of streams and things like that. Um, they also work to provide habitat for butterflies and insects and all sorts of other uh, animals that normally would be less able to inhabit a space like this that just has one crop every year and nothing for six months out of the year. And then also, they, it has this, the, the benefits for uh, soil moisture content, keeping the soil or keeping the soil moist and increasing the, the pores in the soil. There's all sorts of things that are good about them. There's a lot of things we don't know. Um, we know that cover crops, no-till, high biomass accumulation makes healthier soils. Um, we know that that environment should create higher yields. Should, but it doesn't always. That's part of the learning curve. Um, I think the other part of the learning curve, I think because it's, it's in its infancy, we need a technology to be able to farm this way. I mean, there's a reason why mankind never farmed no-till with cover crops, growing commodity crops through the dawn of time. If it was that easy, we would have already had that system in place a thousand years ago. People with horses, when it was 100 degrees out, did not want to be out plowing any more than they do today. You know, it's just, it's human nature. So the reason we always tilled was for weeds. So to think that we're going to recreate the way that we grow food and it's going to be easy, it can't be because otherwise humankind would have figured it out. So I think that figuring all this out by having the technology now to be able to do it and monitor it and measure it, which we never had before, um, is what's led to this style of farming. I don't think it could have been done 30 years ago. So by being able to utilize it now, we have to learn what we're doing. We've had kind of the, what I would consider to be the, almost the artists have kind of started to develop the system. And now we're gonna have the scientists come in behind folks that developed it folks that, that were ahead of me that I've learned from. And now it's time for the scientists to come in and learn it. And we have a whole nother group of scientists, which are these climate scientists coming into it. That has never even, no one even thought about it. So it was never an issue. We never measured carbon. It's not on a standard soil test. without the land, without um, our resources, you know, where are we as a farmer? So we're always looking at what we can do to better ourselves and how we can improve. You're able to be carbon neutral and you're able to um, have that data to share. I think it's definitely going to be um, a piece that will set you apart, at least for the current time. And then I think down the road, it's gonna be a requirement. You know, I think we'll see that being built into contracts. I think that we're gonna see processors um, or buyers just in a hole that are gonna want a piece of that as well. Um, when we look at carbon footprint, even within the dairy industry with organic dairies, with conventional dairies, grass-based dairies, or confinement dairies, um, it's not easy to get a handle on carbon footprint for one type of operation, because even between operations that are of the same style, there's so many variables in dairy. They can make that carbon footprint look so different from one dairy to the next. 
And I think that's that's what our, our processor is also saying is and part of the reason they're going going through the trouble to collect carbon footprint data from operations is to see where what the range is, where herds fall. Um, it's, it's not a cut and dry industry. It's not, um, they're not factories where you can turn off and on switches and pull levers to make everything change on a dime. We're working with biological systems. One thing, I, I take pride in what we do in feeding the American people and, and, and the world, really. And probably the majority of the American people really take for granted that, uh, where their food comes from. You know, they go to the supermarket and buy a can of beans and, or go to McDonald's and get their hamburger. They don't know all the work and uh, sweat that goes in, into producing that. Not often enough, huh, dear? <laughs> Drives her crazy. I can relate. <laughs> <laughs> All this extra rain we've been getting has been just as devastating in areas, you know, that have been really hard hit with it. And especially on the western side of the county. I think they have, if we're getting five or six inches, it seems like they're getting eight or nine inches when, when there's a really heavy rain event. Some of the rain events are more intense, shorter duration, but uh, same way with the, the heat, seems like you have some pretty more warm spells or hot spells. Sometimes I think that's a function of age. <laughs> <laughs> you don't tolerate the heat like I used to. It does seem like some of it has kind of changed. If anything, I kind of think it always seems sometimes that spring doesn't seem to last quite as long as it used to. It does, you know, winter seems to have creeped into a little longer and then summer hits. I think we've definitely been in a cycle with milder winters, but yet we still, every once in a while, get one of those really strong snowstorms. <laughs> um, 
It seems like we go through periods the last few years, we've had a lot of rain. Now we just came off a dry spell, which is normal, but um, you know, I can remember when we've had dry spells that lasted for almost a couple months and you would lose the crops. I, I just remember growing up in high school that you know, in the fall you went to a football game or after school sports, it was always chilly and cold. And now it's, you rarely ever bring out the sweatshirt until, you know, late October. As consumers want healthier food and a healthier environment, um, a big part of getting farmers to do that is that we need to start differentiating what we grow. Um, part of that for me, I think, there, there's a lot of confusion on the consumer end. There's a lot of confu confusion on the agriculture end as to what consumers want. So I think that the, the common word that everyone can speak is carbon sequestration. Common two words, carbon being the word. Um, so I think if, if a farm is carbon neutral or sequestering carbon in some nature, like if we can determine that, that means they're no-till, that means they're cover cropping, that means that they're, they're paying attention to their nutrient loads, they're looking at how much nitrogen they're using. I think all of those things blended together, if we can figure out a common way of doing it, uh, can then start to get farmers a premium for that product, whether it's in the form of wheat and flour for me, or when I grow corn and beans and the chicken that that stuff is fed to that those crops are fed to. On top of that, I think if we can get a carbon market um, where folks are trying to offset carbon, hopefully that will help pay for some activities that I'm doing. Some of the things I'm doing to make me better. Um, not just make me better, but also offer financial incentive for other farmers to farm the same way. There's times that it doesn't necessarily cost more to farm this way, but it is. it, it requires different equipment. Um, it requires a lot of time, it requires a lot of effort, and sometimes you don't get as high a yield. Sometimes you get better yields, hopefully, all the time, but sometimes in the case of corn, um, you know, due to different pests and different things, it can, it takes a little while to learn it. One, the farmer needs to provide more transparency, which we've lacked. I think as a group, we agree on that. Um, so I think as we build transparency into it, which I think that's where the carbon markets and everything else go, because I'm gonna have to be transparent in order for someone to buy a carbon credit from me. 
And I think that transparency can then build into the consumer end of it. So as I become more transparent, it's gonna be up to the consumer to be more responsible in their purchases. It's no longer gonna be organic, non-organic. It's gonna be organic, but here's your carbon footprint of your organic. It's far greater, possibly far greater than what I'm producing as a large scale producer selling my corn to a large scale chicken company that's all of a sudden producing chicken that's much lower in carbon. Which one's the better product? The consumer's gonna need to know, or at least have a belief system based on certain criteria that are intellectual to make that decision. So what I'm going to do here, I'm looking for pod worms or better known as, well, I guess they're officially the corn ear worm. The moths lay the eggs in the uh, soybeans at about this time of year, and then uh, they turn into, hopefully we'll find, well, hope I don't find any, but there'll be a little tiny worm, and then he feeds on the pods of the soybeans. So that's what we're doing. I have 15 swipes, and then uh, you count how many worms you have. And if you have like three or four, that's uh, considered a threshold where you might want to sp consider spray. Now, uh, I'll point out something else here. Well, right, right beside you there, these, they're kind of late. They're, yeah, that, those beans there and you look across the field you see that's a disease that's popped up and it's called sudden death syndrome it's a fungus soil borne it affects the roots uh, shortly after the beans are sprouting yeah it's very hard to get rid of uh, it seems to be more prevalent uh, cool, damp weather. Let's see how much sand Mally left in the seat here. Eh, that's not too bad. Uh oh. Got a bad spot on my starter. One of these days, it's probably going to leave me. When you drive by, like when you come to these fields where you know you're farming here, but then all of a sudden it's a contrast. Do you think anything of it, or how does it make you feel seeing kind of? Uh, well, it's, it's it's sickening, really. I mean, but uh, you know, it's uh, what do you do? I mean, the the family that owned this, uh, he it, it had been farmed by the family for probably. 60 years. The uh, father passed away and he had a son and a daughter who was my dad's age, or yeah. And they knew their one, uh, you know, had an interest in farming uh, and they just uh, rented it out to another farmer for a number of years. And then uh, he, he, uh, he gave it up and then dad and I started back in, uh, I guess late seventies, maybe early eighties, up to like I said, a few years ago. But you know, it's just one of those deals where the family was removed from the farm and uh, and this older gentleman he had well one son, one remaining son, some grandchildren, and I think he just his thought was to sell it and divide it up among the, the children and be done with it. And, you know, they none had uh, interest at all in it. So that's what's, and that's what's happened to most of the development around here. It's uh, very few active farmers have sold their ground. It's mostly farms that's been rented out 
to somebody like myself for a number of years and the family just can get a better return on their money. Anyways, we'll see if we got any critters out here. Uh oh, there we go. We got a corn earworm there. Yeah, he curls up kind of all a lot of times. Get off there. Show you some pods if they've been munching on them. Probably an earworm. Took a bite out of that one and moved on. But at what point do you tell a person you can't do this with your property or your inheritance? Or a person tell them that they can't move here or come here and and, uh, and live? Uh, I think that might have been four. If that's, well, yeah, all total. Five, I guess, which uh, I'll have to keep an eye on it. Let's see. Well, I think it's about lunchtime. Isn't it? <laughs> I think Laura was, uh, she'd want to know what to do for lunch. You could have a hundred acre field and by right, you're entitled to two units per acre. So you can take an acre and divide it in half and have two houses. When it came to calculating the density for a development, say you had that 100 acre field and you had 50 acres of wetlands, you can't build on, but you still by right could count those acres for density. So even though you only had 50 acres you could build on, you could put all 200 units on that 50 acres. You know, first of all, if you're a landowner, it's good because you're not losing that equity. You hear some developers say, well, you know, if we concentrate development in certain areas, it'll do away with the sprawl and better use of the land, you know. But it doesn't, in reality, it doesn't happen because if somebody way out here wants to sell that's the right for the owner you know and if people want to live there and want to buy there you know that seems to be more of the reality so land use is a really sticky issue um, it has been for Sussex County for sure So we do rotational grazing here at Fairhill, uh, and this is really a win-win for both the cow and the pasture. Um, even though our production has decreased about 30% from being a conventional dairy. It's a win for the cow because she, every time she goes out, she is going to new pasture uh, and stimulates intake on her end. And we, we do attribute that to the grazing aspect of it and not just the actual the intake from grazing, but the cows walking like to and from pasture. Um, that is less energy to go towards milk production. Uh, from the pasture standpoint, it's even a bigger win for us because it allows us to go in, harvest a section of pasture, and then get off of that section and give that plant time to recover. Um, if we do continuous grazing, those cows have preferred species of grasses that they want to eat. And so they'll keep going back to those same plants every time there's just a little bit of new regrowth and biting them off, and ultimately they're burning up root reserves on those plants.
hold something? Take this and just walk into that corn there. Straight over. What's that? You want me to grab the thing? Oh, I, we got them coming that way. Uh. uh. We're gonna reverse this. Here. This is why people want to keep them in barns. The funny part is, so when you look at organic and any of these other things with people that are very pro, or I'll say anti capo and then if you were to talk to people of my grandfather's yep. grandfather's generation, <laughs> he'd be quick to tell you all the reasons that they went away from those things. This big one. Now, the tough part about electric fences are they are not a barrier fence. It's all I Electric fences are only a deterrent, so they're only a deterrent if they've got good current on them. That's the kind of reason we talk to a lot, even a lot of guys in the farm. That's why they don't want, why they don't want cow. Because who wants to do this on Sunday night? I don't know. more minutes and you'll never get cows out of there. Hello. Hey. 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 Problem with Grande. Um, to separate with this, yeah, they had it. They had it. They Uh, I can try, but chance of me getting an accurate count or not. Not good. Not good. Well, uh, do I need to shorten this stroke? Or are we going to let Kara hold it on right? No, she's got potential on it. Okay. Ah, not going to be good. $174, $175. The evolution so far into this carbon market has been natural. But what they're talking about is then, all right, Trey, if we're gonna sell in private to another company, you need to open your farm up again to be transparent. 
so that everyone knows what you're doing so that if they sell this on a global marketplace, that company knows that when they say, I sequestered 1.5 tons of carbon per acre, that company can check it. Well, how are they gonna check it? A third party verifier, but you've got 365 days. Who's to say I'm not gonna apply it? But now with technology, we can use uh, satellite imagery, right? There's a picture of my field taken every day that it's sunny. It shows the vegetative growth. We can calibrate that to biomass accumulation. So then we can correlate that to how much carbon is actually sequestered based on the cover crop or the crop. Um, so we've got that. So then they're like, okay, well, we need to put it in a blockchain. Blockchain is a, a essentially a spreadsheet or a book that can't be altered, okay? But it's in the cloud and you get paid with cryptocurrency, but we won't go there because I don't understand it. But so my thought process was, okay, so we've got complete transparency in my production cycle. We're showing the carbon cycle of the crop cycle. We're showing that we're net positive on carbon sequestration. And to me, if you're carbon neutral or positive carbon in the growth of your crops, then you're probably doing a good job with the ecology surrounding your crops because it means you had living roots all year long. It means that you built resiliency in your soil and you didn't do tillage, which are all the primary components of soil health and soil resiliency. So now all of a sudden we have a great story to tell. So it's a large scale farm, but with a good story that I think eventually, this is down the road, you'll be able to see that the chicken was fed the corn from my farm and you'll be able to see the chicken farm. Maybe it's the hills that you interviewed earlier. And you'll see that my corn went to the hill, we fed the chickens, we took care of the chickens, then went to the processor. Some of that will have to be in the aggregate because we have these big silos that we put all our stuff in, literal silos, not figurative silos. Um, but I think that it could be tracked and based on truckloads so that as you go to the store, the, the, the corn that was grown on Harborview that went to the hills, hopefully that chicken is worth two or three percent more than the chicken that might have been grown in Indiana and has a much larger carbon footprint because of the trucking, the refrigeration, etc. cetera. Um, I don't know if any of this will transpire, but I think all of that will kind of flows through the carbon marketplace, through the soil health, the ecological carbon end user. Um, but I think it's a, it's a long ways away, but I think it's something uh, that we should start um, aspiring to do. Trouble comes and it always 